All right, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining us for the Alt Dev Student Summit. We are pleased to present Bobby Angelov. Note that you may submit questions via the Google Moderator link at any time, and we're going to address these questions at the Q&A during the end. So without further interruption, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter. Hi. Um, well, my name is Bobby Angelov. I'm a programmer working at IO Interactive in Denmark. Um, this talk is going to be a brief overview of what my job entails and what it's like working in AAA. Um, it's going to be pretty brief, and I'm going to just leave a bit of space at the end for some questions. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a 28-year-old expat. I moved to Copenhagen about 16 months ago to work at IO on Hitman Absolution. Prior to this, I spent around a decade working in um, commercial software, point-of-sale systems, uh, database systems, that kind of thing. And I spent two years teaching computer graphics programming at a university. Um, so yeah, I don't actually use Google Plus or anything like that. If you want to get hold of me, Twitter's probably the best bet. So you can ping me through that afterwards. Now let's get right ahead. Like I said, I worked in Hitman Absolution. The game's coming out in nine days' time, so I really hope you guys go out and buy a copy. That's going to be pretty awesome. Um, what I did in Absolution was I basically did all the low-level navigation systems for the AI. I did the pathfinding, the avoidance systems. I also helped out with the crowd animation system, um, some of the combat AI, and I did a bit of um, IK for the weapon holding. So a little bit across the board there, but primarily staying in the AI and um, animation areas. So this talk's basically going to cover where I work, what I do, what uh, various program opportunities there are in AAA for you, and also what the reality of working in AAA is. And at the end, I'm going to open up some questions. So as I said, I work at um, IO Interactive. Right? Uh, we're in Denmark, and we have a great office. We get breakfast, we get lunch, we don't crunch much. Um, we have like Friday bars and we have board game nights and we do lots of cool things at work um, outside of work time. So that's pretty good. Um, what is my job description? Well, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I'm part of a tech team or an engine team for a game project. Um, my responsibilities involve the maintenance and improvement to the navigation systems. I maintain the app mesh integration, the pathfinding systems, all that. I've also built an um, AI framework, which we're using to basically um, schedule all sensor updates and decision making and so on for the AI. And again, I'll be responsible for that for most of the project. And I'm also involved in developing MPC locomotion technology. That's basically um, the tech behind getting a character to walk, walk around and animate and make sure that there's no glitches and foot sliding and other things like that. Um, as part of the tech engine team, um, I basically help out with other core um, areas where, where you know, we need to do some bug fixing whatever else at the time. So my daily routine, um, well, I have to get to work. And in Denmark, that means riding a bike get to my computer, turn it on, and get a cup of coffee. And that's where my day usually starts. So what do I do all day? Well, primarily this. Um, I do feature development, which basically means that I don't really know what I'm doing. I get given a bunch of dolls and told, you know, we need to get something like this working. Can you figure out a way how? And I sit with a couple of other programmers and we discuss it and just get some ideas, do some research, and you know, um, basically do an outline. So my primarily um, work structure is to just, so given a set of goals, do some basic research, do a basic outline on some paper. Um, I, I don't really code a lot in the early stages. I basically just try and sketch it out. Usually that uh, highlights some obvious flaws. Um, you know, you use back and forth a bit of times, you know, with a whiteboard, sit there, say, hey, you know, draw a big diagram, say, hey, can you guys see any problem with this? And somebody will be like, well, what if this happens or what if that happens? And you kind of just, you know, iterate a bit um, on paper until you're pretty happy with it and you think you've solved most of the problems. And then we solve the first implementation. At that point, we'll build it. We'll think of uh, one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make is they think of something as a prototype as 
that's not a prototype and often end up shipping that prototype. So don't start off with the idea that this is dead code, we're going to throw it away, we're going to clean it up, we're going to do it better second time around. Rather do it right the first time and, and take a bit more effort in just being cons correct and taking care of your code and just, just take think of it as the actual final product. After you've built this prototype and you think you're pretty good with it and it works and it's pretty solid, hand it over to your level designers and they will break it within a day. Guaranteed. If, if they don't, they're not the level designers. It'll come back broken in ways that you never imagined. So you will fix it, you chat to them, say, what do you guys need? What was bad, what was good? Where can we improve? You try and make it better, you hand it over to them and they break it again. And you kind of keep doing this until it's finally in a shape that um, they can use or they're really happy with, you know, this could be one or two iterations, it could be five, six, depending on the goals and the system. And then you end up maintaining the system. So maintenance pretty much ends right at the end of the day. So you, you pretty much only ever end supporting that system when you ship the game. So that brings me to the second part of my day job. What do I pretty much do? Well, I so do support bug fixing. Um, the systems I maintain obviously have some issues and like any other system in the world, you know, people want to use them in weird ways or they want new features and this and that. So a lot of the time it's just uh, talking to level designers and con providers and say, well, how is the tool for you? Is it working good? Is there problems? What can we do to address them? How can we improve the feature sets? And, and sort of just basically interact with them on a one-to-one -one basis and just find out exactly what their needs are and see if your tool meet, meets their needs. And if your tool or tech doesn't, then you make it better. Um, at the end of the day, they're the guys that are using this stuff to build the game and making it awesome and everything. So you want to give them the best set of tools and the best set of tech um, that they can you know, have to make an awesome game. Um, also, sometimes I try not to strangle them because you know you build a really great piece of software and then they break it. This is also a good uh, reason not to um, let colleagues have access to your Facebook account. They'll find some very old photo and they put it, put it up in the wall and say, "Haha, funny joke." You know, it's not the best thing you want to see first thing in the morning. And the last part of my job, which my leads probably shouldn't find out about, is uh, the cowboy coding part, where you know sometimes you have to fix a bug now. We have to add a feature now, and you know you say it's going to take a week, and they say, well, you have a day. So you, you kind of just, dare I say, slightly hack it in. This is almost always a last resort. Um, this never really happens. Primarily, most of the time, you have a lot of time to finish things properly. But sometimes when you're up against the wall and you have to fix something like uh, bug, you, you get around to things a bit. Um, I like to think that I almost never do this, but once in a while I do catch myself being bad, and then I kind of slap myself and have to do it properly. Um, the major takeaway from this is even though you're tempted to do it, don't. It ends up costing you more time and effort in the long run to, than just doing it properly the first time around. I had a situation where I you know, decided to hot fix the problem and broke the entire game across every other level except the level I was fixing, and ended up taking me four times as long to fix the problem properly because of the hack, then it would have taken me just to sit down and think about it for a bit longer and just do it properly. So don't be tempted by this and avoid this at all costs. Um, hmm. My blank side? Oh, wait. Um, so now the boring part of my day, I have meetings. This is basically with uh, level designers or other programmers or team leads or whatever just um, discussing how the project's going, future steps, you know, lots of boring stuff like that. I answer email, look at bug reports or whatever else I have. Um, finally, as every programmer loves to do, there's documentation work to be done. If you build a system, you obviously need to document it, otherwise, well, nobody can use it. Um, this is two parts, one both in code, um, making sure that uh, commenting is pretty good, and secondly, to try and write nice uh, Word documents or wikis for feature sets and tools we have. Um, the level designers find that extremely useful being able to just select an item and go to a wiki page and just you know um, get an overview of what's happening. 
and how the, the item works and what they're supposed to hook up and wire up and we'd talk to something as well. So, cool things at work. Um, I get lots of cool hardware to play with. Something slow, I say, hey, uh, my machine's a little bit slow, my compile times are uh, an extra 20 seconds longer, don't, don't you want to just give me a new CPU? And IT usually does, which is kind of nice. Um, as a programmer, you, you tend to get a pretty nice machine. Um, we get free Red Bull, which is nice. Um, but again, it's just a little perky. But the main thing that's nice at working at my company is that we own all of our own tech. This basically means that um, if you want to do any new features or engine work, we can because you know our engine team's upstairs. The guys that wrote the engine, we can sit with them, discuss it, get uh, support, and just uh, properly plug in a new feature, which then can be, you know, accepted by the engine team into the core and set out for other game teams to use at any point. Um, you know, the licensing model where you license a game engine and then have to sort of work around the design is a bit problematic, especially if you're trying to push limits. This gives us an extra edge in that, and that if we want to do something that may be fundamentally different to how the engine is structured, we can actually discuss it and implement it in a nice, clean way, rather than trying to work around um, some other team's code without any kind of like discussion with them. Now, basically, that's what I do all day. I sit around and I write code. Um, I didn't want to go into too much detail. There's not enough time for that. Uh, if anybody is interested in more of that, they can ping me on Twitter. Um, so the rest of this talk is just going to be basically breaking down what are your options in AAA and where your career can take you. Um, I'm going to start with the basic structures. We have, at least at IO and a few other studios that I know, we have three basic uh, groups. We have the tech team guys um, for the game team. That's where I fit in. Basically, it's just AI programs, animation, physics. It's the guys basically maintaining the low-level technology that the game is built on. Um, on top of that is the game team. Those are primarily the gameplay programs and the generalist guys. They um, take the tech and they kind of, um, I don't know what's the way to put it, just they basically work with it to create the game. They take these systems and then they write behaviors and they um, hook up physics entities and they write uh, really nice like managers and systems to kind of hook everything up like take all these low-level components, plug them all together, and, and pump out a cool game. And right at the bottom of everything is the core tech team. That's the, the basically the core technology group. They're the guys that actually built the engine. Um, they maintain all the low-level features, like the math libraries, you know, the, the physics integrations, all the network layers, and everything else like that. So the difference between the game tech team and the, the core tech team is, is primarily that we try and build low-level technology that the game team uses directly on top of what the core tech team has done. Um, even though we're still an engine team, we tend to be higher level um, than the core guys. And we kind of try to solve problems that we have right now where the core guys are trying to think ahead. Career-wise, um, I think the most common structure is junior, uh, mid, and senior levels. I've seen some tiers at other companies with um, software engineer one, software engineer two, software engineer three, something like that. But I think that the junior, mid, and senior model is the the pretty much most common one. Um, right at the top, you can get to be a lead programmer and a technical director. Those positions tend to be more management than actual code. So um, again, it's, uh, it's a distinction there where you can be a programmer and not actually do any programming, but rather manage a team and direct the, the way the tech's going or design decisions, system architectures, and that sort of thing without actually writing much code. That's that's fundamentally what the leads are doing, and the technical director would sit right at the top directing the team leads and basically trying to keep a grasp of, you know, overall tech issues that the entire team is doing so nobody runs wild. Um, that's primarily the career, uh, career ladder. Um, internships, it was mentioned earlier that um, it's a difficult route. I'm not so sure. We've got one or two interns right now, and they seem to be doing a pretty good job of uh, you know, managing. So I would actually suggest that if you could get an internship at a AAA company, it's 
definitely going to be a good experience. Even if they don't keep you on, it's definitely something um, that will broaden your you know, horizons and just kind of gives you a bit of experience. So I mentioned that uh, we have a bunch of different roles in the industry. Um, the nice thing about AAA is that we can specialize. Um, there's enough programmers on the team that, you know, we can have guys that focus uh, just on AI, just on physics, or just on animation, or whatever else like that. Where with a smaller team, you kind of tend to be a generalist and wear a lot of hats and jump around between areas and not really be able to specialize. So now I'm going to go from the highest level down. Um, basically, the gameplay programmers, they're what you would uh, imagine an indie programmer would be, they're part programmer, part designer. They're, they're fundamentally in the trenches of the level of game designers. They, they sit together and, and they basically prototype gameplay features and mechanics and just, just make a fun game. They do level specific work and they plug stuff in and write custom behaviors for NPCs for certain levels and this kind of thing. Um, they're basically the interface between the rest of the programming team and the um, level designers. And I think that they're probably the fundamental guys in getting a game shipped. Um, I think them and the tools programmers, those, those two are pretty, pretty important. Um, AI programmers, this is uh, again where I kind of slot in. We basically take care of some of the core tech behind the MPCs, um, stuff like knowledge systems for the MPCs knowing what they're doing and pathfinding and locomotion and tactical positioning when they get into a fight or if they're investigating something. There seems to be a huge dependency between AI and animation, so a lot of AI programmers are animation programmers and vice versa. Um, the two fields are getting very intermixed, uh, especially on a high level in the game team. Um, I started out as an AI programmer and now I end up doing a lot of animation work, um, which is really cool. I kind of really enjoy that. Um, coming to animation programmers, well, basically, there's usually two types of guys that um, build the actual animation networks, like um, hook up what animations to use, what kind of um, locomotion systems we're going to use, how the network's going to be structured, how many layers we're going to have, where we put IK, this kind of thing. And then we also have the guys that uh, deal on more the pipeline side that, that deal with, you know, animation exporting, compression levels, um, file formats and all those kind of things. So again, it's kind of split between the high-level game team and you know, the low-level engine team work. Um, tools guys, these, these guys are super important. Um, I can't do anything really without a nice tools guy with me working with me. Um, they basically handle all the editors and the tools and all the custom exporters and basically they keep everything running for the, the content providers and the you know, guys in the trenches. Um, everything they do is usually built in a tool that's written by one of these guys, and they are really like important. Once again, I um, don't know if I mentioned, but I was hiring right now, so if anybody's interested in any kind of programming work, we've got lots of positions open. So, you know, just feel free to send through in a resume or ping me afterwards, and we can try to work something out. Um, I'm going to quickly speed through this. Network programmers, physics and render, primarily they do exactly as the job, to, um, exactly as the title says. Um, there's not too much going on there. Physics guys, in general, maintain um, physics integration systems, uh, middleware systems, so like Havoc or PhysX, and wrap that and then plug that into game code and just make sure that uh, everything's working and performing as intended. Um, Render guys, again, just focus on render and network programmers. Usually we, we have a lot of metrics guys that kind of see how many bullets are fired and all these kind of um, in-game metrics reporting, and we have a lot of those on staff. Um, engine programmers, well, they're the guys that do the core systems. They're, in our case, I think, for the most part, they're generalists. Um, they intend to be the really hardcore guys, um, the ones that, you know, you, people joke that they think in hex or whatever. Um, some really smart guys working with us. They basically write all the math libraries, the containers, data structures, um, all the super like base level components that our engine is built on and our games are built on. So these guys sit in the core uh, group, and another you know part of that is to maintain that our like solutions work and compile settings are set up properly, and that our compile times are good and whatever else. That's basically the career options. Um, 
as I said, there's a lot of options that in AAA you can start out as a gameplay programmer, which is what I was hired as, and then transition into AI if you show an aptitude or an interest in it. Um, again, once you're in a company, it's well, depending on the company, at least with us, it's, it's reasonably easy to transfer from one area to another if you've got an interest or that's where you want to end up working. Um, you know, I know guys who spend, you know, two, three years working as a physics programmer, then swap over to tools or swap over to animation or something else that interests them. And that's the, the one benefit of AAA that we have a lot of these options. Um, now, the reality of AAA, um, there's been a lot of bad press, I guess, and there's a lot of also, both from the game media side and from indie guys, there's kind of we're the enemy and that uh, the AAA industry is horrible to work in and we get treated really badly and it's crunch and it's horrible. And I don't, I don't know how true that is. Um, my experiences, at least uh, at IO, have been really good. We don't crunch that much, even though we've, we've had deadlines. Um, we've, got our, we've made all our deadlines with minimal crunch. Um, a lot of friends in other companies are also really happy and they get treated really well. I think this varies from company to company, but obviously the media is only going to report on the bad stuff. So again, I would take what you read about bad crunch and bad work conditions with a grain of salt. And this is, you know, no matter the field, some companies are good and some companies are bad. Um, generalizing this is really bad. This mentality also that, you know, AAA games are killing the industry and, you know, killing innovation and, you know, all these kind of things. I'm sure that could, that's probably true of some companies and some games, but for the most part, I think the people I work with are super enthusiastic about what they're doing. They're super enthusiastic about making great games and, and trying new things and just, you know, experimenting and, and playing with that. And then, there are a lot of AAA companies that allow you to kind of try new things and, you know, just, just basically um, prototype and, and try new ideas and, and try and make the best game possible. I don't think that it's fair to say that, you know, we are all churning out Call of Duty clones and, you know, that there's no innovation going on. I think that's very unfair to say that. Um, in general, I think that the only difference between AAA and Indie it's just that um, AAA gives you a little bit more chances of programmer to specialize in a, in a certain field. So I, I would definitely, well, personally, I'm a tech programmer. I, I prefer doing tech. I'm not so fond of game code. Um, and for me, being in AAA is, is the best thing for me since I can now work, you know, in areas and focus in areas where I'm interested in. Um, rather than trying to generalize and jump around between the different areas. Whereas I know people that love the, the generalization, the, the trenches mentality, and the, the working on a million projects at once, kind of jumping in and fixing things and making things work, and you know, kind of just, just making an awesome game, just wherever they need it, they just jump right in. Um, it depends on your mentality and what you're interested in, but that's the one benefit of AAA, where if you want to be a programmer designer, you can be, but if you just want to be a hardcore programmer and just sit and you know optimize data structures all day, you can do that as well and still be part of you know a great game at the end of the day. Um, so let me just quickly wrap this up as time's running out. Crunch, um, sure, it exists. Um, severity varies. Some guys crunch a lot, some guys don't crunch a lot. We crunched a bit towards the end of the absolution, but it was pretty light. Um, I actually, you know, it's it's nowhere near some of these horror stories you hear. And to be honest, like uh, the crunch we had in Absolution was way more chilled than some of the crunch of experience in the commercial industry, where you crunch as well, except it doesn't make it into the gaming news. I, I've had projects um, for companies doing point of sale systems where I basically go home to shower and go straight back to work. You know, horror stories like that, and that's not just in games. Uh, job security, luckily for programmers, there's always work. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier for us. If a company goes down to something, that there's always work and kind of transition to commercial software or something like that. So uh, there is a fair amount of job security. Um, also, the industry is quite small, so once you get in, you're pretty much in. So there's no reason to worry about, you know, oh no, the company's going to close down or, or this kind of stress. Um, I'm sure if you have a family, it's, it's a little bit trickier, but in general, there's, there's opportunities as a programmer out there. Um, and that's basically it. 
Um, I've got a small guide for education options for guys that are still starting out a degree or thinking about starting a degree. Um, I put a tiny URL over there. It's on my website, techinitiative.net. Uh, you can check it out there. It's, it's an old tech blog that I don't really keep up to date anymore, but still some useful information. As I said, if you want to get hold of me, Twitter's the best option. Um, I just made a Google Plus account now just for this talk, and I'm going to cancel it after this. So, yeah, if there's any questions. Hi, I'm looking at the feed right now, and uh, I'm not seeing any questions, but if you have any final comments or anything else you wanted to add? Uh, not really. I guess uh, that's, that's about it. Okay. Um, in that case, thank you very much for speaking today, and thanks to all of you who are watching. And please check back for the rest of the programming today, because there are lots of more great talks, and uh, they'll be starting pretty shortly. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.